بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين نويت التعلم والتعليم والتذكر والتذكير والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وبسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والدعاء على الهداء والدلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله إن شاء الله تعالى today we finish the letter finally we've been reading this letter for some time now الحمد لله um, so um, we're basically We've been, uh, we have been going through the conclusion for the past two classes, to be honest. So Imam al-Ghazali um, finishing off the letter to his disciple with four things that he um, enjoins upon his disciple, to, um, orders him to do. Uh, sorry, four things to not do. And um, um, firstly is to refrain from uh, argumentation. Secondly, is to guard, be on guard against becoming a preacher or sermonizer. Um, thirdly, what was the third one? <clears throat> um, where is this? Um, yeah. The third, thirdly, is that um, you distance yourself from rulers, from rulers. Um, from people of authority, from people of authority. Yeah, so now we're going to look at the fourth one, isn't it? which is actually an extension of the third one, which is going to show us the severity of um, colluding with people in authority. Um, Bismillah. Uh, Muhammad, would you like to read, please? Bismillah. <clears throat> The fourth thing to give up is to accept nothing of the benefaction of princes, nor their, pe nor their presence, even if you know they are acquired legitimately. For expecting it from them degrades religion, in that psychophony, partiality for them and complicity in their tyranny are produced by it. All this corruption all this is corruption in religion. The least of its harm is that when you receive their donations and profit from their material possessions, you like them, and whoever likes an individual would prefer him to have a long lifespan unavoidably. Preferring the survival of the tyrant constitutes a desire for the creature of God, the exalted, to continue to suffer tyranny and a desire of the world's ruination. What is worse than this for religion and our final end? Our, and our final ends. Beware, beware that the demons' suggestions or some people's talk to you does not deceive you to the effect that the best and the most appropriate thing is for you to receive the money from them and distribute it amongst the poor and beggars, for they are wasting it in dissolute living and disobedience, and your spending it on helpless people is better than their spending it. For the accursed one has severed many people's necks by these whisperings. We have mentioned this in the revival of the sciences, so look for it there. As for the four things, <coughs> which... second, we'll finish this off <coughs> and then we'll get into the four things to do. Yeah, Jazakallah <coughs> khairan. So carrying on from um, the third thing which Imam al-Ghazali um, enjoins upon his disciple to refrain from is not just to avoid colluding um, or draw, being close to people of authority, do not accept anything from them. Do not accept anything from them. Yeah. Why? Why? Even if it were acquired legitimately. Why? Because expectation 
let alone from people of authority. Expectation from anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in and of itself degrades religion. That you expect from anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do something for you. And the fact that you expect it from people of authority, uh, if you do expect it from people of authority, is that you're expecting a favor by which they single you out against others. So, um, um, psychophancy is basically, in layman's terms, like sucking up to the people for an unfair advantage, yeah, um, <clears throat> and partiality for them. So, expect all of these um, are um, downright dangerous for one's religion. Are downright dangerous for one's religion. Firstly, that they do not see that the person who gives is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, that they do not care how they acquire what they want to acquire. All that they are concerned is with getting what they want. Um, by whatever means necessary, um, by um, uh, drawing close to the people of authority. So these things, no doubt, degrade one's religion. Yeah. Um, and not only that, it now makes one complicit in their tyranny. Such that if you are colluding with someone um, in authority and um, they bestow upon you favors on that basis, um, you are now quote unquote partners in crime in whatever it is that they do. Like whatever it is that see that person, such and such person, he's close to such and such person and he gets all these things from them and see how the other, other person does to others. Yeah. Um, so you're complicit in the tyranny. Yeah. And all of this is corruption in the religion. It corrupts one's religion, literally it corrupts one's religion. Because what religion, they say, is <clears throat> one of the foremost concerns of religion and one of the foremost concerns of spirituality is making sure that your sustenance and that which you acquire is lawful. Anything and everything is secondary. Doesn't matter how long one stands and prays in the middle of the night. If, they are, uh, if their wealth is acquired unlawfully, doesn't mean anything. Doesn't their they're standing in their night, night doesn't mean anything. Yeah, doesn't um, and they're giving in charity from that which they've acquired unlawfully as well. Doesn't mean anything. Yeah, one of the first and foremost concerns of religion is that you make your income lawful, your your uh, what that which you acquire lawful, and no doubt, engaging in such uh, activities will uh, inevitably compromise that. Will ine inevitably compromise that. Um. Uh, and the the least of its harm is that when you receive their donations and profit from their material positions, you like them, no doubt. Person likes one who is good to them, or gives them that which they want, and who likes an and whoever likes an individual would prefer him to have a long lifespan unavoidably. And preferring the survival of the tyrant constitutes a desire for the creatures of God, the exalted, to continue to suffer in tyranny, i.e. as long as you're good, as long as they're being good to you, you couldn't care less about others. That they wrong others by fearing you and others suffer as a consequence. If um, if that is of no consequence to you, then no doubt this is for this is from the essence of one's religion being corrupted. And a desire for the world's ruination for this is to seek ruination of the, the world, the world which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in, in balance and commanded the human being not to break the balance. Yeah, that we desire injustice and oppression and wrongdoing is um, this is no doubt not just corruption in one's religion, but this is corruption on the face of the earth. Um, the point to note here, the point to note here, Imam Al Ghazali, when he talks about rulers, he by default labels them as tyrants. By default, labels them as tyrants. Why? 
Why? Because the one who is not a tyrant is not a part of this discussion. The one who is not a tyrant is in no way, i.e. a just ruler. A just ruler is in no way going to favor you in anything to do um, big, um, at a personal level uh, by exploiting his office, by exploiting his office. So that's not a part of this discussion at all. A, a just ruler, a just ruler, the one who is fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah, and knows that he's accountable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the authority with uh, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon him. That person is in no way going, that person is not a part of this discussion. For example, the righteous, uh, the Khulafa or Rashidun, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he was the Khalifa, Umar radiallahu anhu, Uthman radiallahu anhu, Ali radiallahu anhu, when they were the people, they were the Khalifas, this is not this discussion does not relate to people like them because they would in no way ex, they wouldn't know it wouldn't even occur to them it would be the furthest thing from that which would occur to them is to somehow use their position of authority in a manner which is not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they do not fall under this discussion so Imam al-Ghazali by default when he talks about rulers he talks about tyrants because a just ruler will not in any way engage you or entertain you in in a manner that which is unfair so you deal with them so when they deal with you on a personal level they are not dealing with you on the basis that they are a ruler they are the rulers they deal with you on a personal level and you deal with them on a personal level. So your relationship with them is then that not, is not that of a relationship uh, of a subject to a ruler. It's, it's, it's a personal relationship then. That does not come into this in the pic, uh, picture. Like, like Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the grandson of Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu anhuma, he was, he was the khali, when he was the Khalifa, people forced him to become the Khalifa and he did not want to become the he. He had no, he was literally forced to take up the position. And when, and on one instance, um, the Beit al-Mal, the state treasury, um, some perfume was brought. Obviously, in those days, it was not just um, currency. Wealth was stored in all different, uh, accepted in different forms. So perfume, per, some perfume was brought into the state treasury. And as the perfume was brought, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu anhu, he closed his nose, he closed his nose. Um, and um, the people asked like, what are you doing that for? And he's like, this belongs to the state. This is the state, belongs to the state treasury and it does not belong to me. So it is haram upon me to smell it because the perfume, what is there in the perfume? The perfume is there for the smell, for, for the fragrance. So it is not permissible for me to even um, uh, enjoy the fragrance. Such a person is not going to give you anything because of his position, unless that which is due to you. So that person is not a part of this discussion. And again, all of this is to do even with a Muslim at the end of the day, even if the tyrant is a Muslim, this discussion, let alone if, if the people in authority are non-Muslim, that we go to them, quote unquote, we scratch your back, you scratch ours, we'll, we'll, we'll vote for you and you're going to give us X, Y and Z. It's like this is corruption in religion. That's what that's that's what Imam Al-Ghazali is saying. And he's saying that this is to do with Muslim tyrannical rulers. So with regards to non-Muslims, then our and then our dealing with them is purely is purely um, to draw them into the fold of Islam, that we show them Islam um, by living Islam, not really for showing them, but by living it for ourselves. <clears throat> and that if they want something from us, like Imam al-Ghazali previously mentioned, if someone wants something from you, you give it to them as long as it does not contravene the religion, as long as it's something which is lawful, whatever they ask, give. People, when they ask, give it to them. Do what people want as long as it's not unlawful, and then do not expect anything from them. Do not expect anything from them. Um, and uh, in our context, um, especially in the UK, we are there to give, we are not there to take. Yeah, 
the only leg uh, legitimizing um, reason for us to be in the UK is da'wah, is to call people to Islam. So we are not there to take from people anything of this fleeting existence, but rather we are there to give them that will give them life in the hereafter, which is everlasting. So that should be the basis of our interaction with anyone and everyone. Yeah. <clears throat> um, which also includes people of authority. Um, beware, yeah. What is worse? Sorry, yeah. What is worse than this for religion and our final ends? Yeah. So all of this, why, why, why do people fall into such traps? Because we do not, we do, we are heedless of our final end, or where, um, of what is to come. We are rather caught up in, oh. I might. I think this is going to be beneficial for me, or or um, who um, or us as a community, or whatever. So I'll kind of. Um, oh, life is full of compromises. No, no. You can compromise in your dunya. Do not compromise in your akhirah. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever to compromise in the akhirah. Yeah. What is worse than this for religion and our final ends? Beware, beware that the dem demons suggestions. Or some people talks to you. <clears throat> some people talk to you does not deceive you to the effect that the best and the most appropriate th thing is for you to receive the money from them and distribute it amongst the poor and the beggars, for they're wasting it in dissolute living and disobedience, and that you're spending it on helpless people is better than them. Um, they're spending it. Yeah, again, the moment you accept a favor, monetary or not. You have already compromised yourself. You have compromised yourself critically. Not just in the Akhirah, you have compromised yourself in the front, in the face of the person who um, you took the favor from. Yeah, you are there, you are there. We are there for da'wah, for inviting people um, to Islam. And there you are taking um, the favors under the table from a person who, as a politician, is just um is just concerned with what what benefits him um um uh, in with regards to retaining his authority and he sees muslims behaving in such a manner oh see they are not they, there's nothing about them there's nothing um um remarkable about them at all they just they i'm scratching their back they're scratching mine yeah um i'm giving them what they want they'll give me what i want yeah so <clears throat> So you have already compromised your religion. You have compromised your religion. You've compromised your religion. You've compromised religion itself in the face of the person you took uh, the favor from, which is possibly worse. Not that not just that you compromise your own religion um, um, by taking a favor, but now that the religion itself stands compromised in the eyes of the person who did you the favor. Yeah, and and like Mama Ghazali says, this is just this is just corruption. This is just corruption. Yeah, um, um. So do not do not fall for do not fall for the satan satanic uh, satanic whispers. Yeah, for the accursed one has severed many people's necks by these whisperings. Yeah, it's it's a slippery slope. Yeah, like they say, um, the. <clears throat> Um, the path to hellfire is lined by good intentions. Yeah, the, the shaitan, one of the um, ways by which he tricks is by giving you a good intention.
Assalamu alaikum. Apologies. <laughs> I'm speaking to myself. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Mm, where did I get to? The path of hellfire is um, lined with good intentions. Yes. Yeah. So that's what they say. The path, the, the path to hellfire is lined with good intentions. Yeah. One of the ways, um, one of the more successful ways, one of the more successful tricks of the shaitan is to give you good, noble, lofty intentions for your wrongdoing. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's for the good. See all the benefits it can come out of it and see all the good it can bring. Yeah, but it's haram in it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, um, so that's one of the ways by which the shayt, and it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope, and before you know it, it is it's just all going downhill. It's all going downhill, uh, going downhill all the way from the dunya into the akhirah. It's just a slippery slope straight into the pits of hell. Yeah, so those are the four things which Imam al-Ghazali says. You need to give up. You need to give up. First one, argumentation. Second one, be on guard against becoming a preacher. Third one, is third one and fourth one, both of them to do with people of authority. Be on guard against people of authority. Any questions or comments before we carry on? When, when we were reading about this, the trickery of the devil, it just yeah. reminded me of an incident very, very long time ago. Uh, when I was at university, um, you know, you got the freshers fair and then you no. get given. What's, what happens in uni stays in uni. Uh, yes, yes. No, but, I mean, this. I think there's good in this, so you might as well talk about it. But um, there was there was this freshers fair, and as you know, they give you gifts. And um, it was me and two of the brothers. We were walking around, and then we got a bags of of, of uh, sweets as gifts. Yeah. And then when we got home, we were looking through it, and a lot of them, um, they were not halal. Yeah. So um, so then I said, okay, that's fine. Instead of wasting it, let's just give it to somebody who is not Muslim. And then. Mm. This brother said to me, but um, we should be um, we should be wanting for others what we want for ourselves. And mm. if we can't eat it because it's haram, mm. then it doesn't mean that we should give it to somebody else, give them haram food to eat. Mm -hmm. and, and that really struck a chord with me because, um, as, as you said, with the trickery of the devil here, you, mm. you're thinking I'm going I'm doing a better act by giving the food away instead of throwing it away. Ooh. But then you're giving away something haram. And Ooh. as you mentioned earlier, Ooh. our um, our relationship with people in the UK is to invite them to Islam. So if yeah. we're giving them something haram, what are they going to think about the religion? Oh, look, he says you shouldn't have alcohol, but then he's given me something with alcohol in it. Um, so that means he's just throwing it away, and I'm I'm basically I'm basically a, a rubbish bin for him. <laughs> well, that that's even worse, isn't it? Because then <laughs> imagine imagine if you're a person and somebody gives it to you and then says, "Well, uh, this is not good enough for me, so have it, you have it." I mean, it's even you know, at a personal level, if you, the person would feel even worse. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so so that since because because as you said initially, I sort of was feeling. I don't want to waste the food, but then in this case, it's the better thing to do. No, because no, but, but no, but the thing is, it's not food. <laughs> That's the point. Well, <laughs> well that, that makes it even easier. Well, I should have met you then. <laughs> make it even easier. And um, yeah, and then and then he told me. Um, I, 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 he told me the story of. Um, I'm sure you've heard it as well. A, a very pious man um, who um, basically um, there was. Um, a sister who needed looking after. Uh, so the people went to the most pious man and said, OK, you can she stay with you? Can you look after him? And then he kept on refusing, kept on refusing to the end where he had to give in. And when he gave in, he made sure that in his house uh, she was kept completely separate because he didn't want to be tempted. But then gradually um, you know, he was putting the food through the door and then gradually the relationship got a bit closer. To the point, there's a few things that happen, you know, including um, um, unlawful relationships to the point where um, the devil then came to him and said, well, if you sell your soul to me, I'll sort it all out. 
<laughs> and then once he did that, I say, okay, sorry, uh, I was joking. Um, you know, so it's 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 fun. It's it's um. That's, uh, that's not that's not just like a fable. That uh, that's that, I, I guess that's um, that that story plays out. Unfortunately, yeah. in many a place, many a time. Mm. Yeah, um, uh, like um, um, the reason the reason the Sharia is there. Like that, the, like that's one of the things. Like why we need to, um, so we need to have an understanding of what is called maqasid the Sharia, the the objectives of the Sharia, why the Sharia is in place and why it is the way it is for people to have some appreciation of um, um, the the legal framework which we have. Why is it in place? Why why do we have it? Why are there so um, seemingly um, strict rulings with regards to some aspects of um, society. Mm. Why? Why? And and this is something, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of. We need we need we need to be educated. One of the things we need to be educated is in maqasid the Sharia. It's not just people by like people throwing rules at each other, but actually people having an understanding of why are there those rules in the first place. Mm. True. Yeah, um, and this is different to Usul al-Fiqh. Usul al-Fiqh is deriving the rulings. How do you derive rulings from your primary sources? Maqaz is this to look at the reason, like why? Why is it the way it is? And um, or, and what's the wisdom? Trying to understand the wisdom, the hikmah behind the um, the Sharia, which is important, which is important um, in our day and age where people, um, which, yeah, like you said, uh, uh, we just... Uh, um yeah the shaitan is having a field day isn't it it's his age i guess um <clears throat> yeah so yeah those are the four things which um imam al-ghazali um uh, he calls on his student to refrain from inshallah ta'ala bismillah the next one as for the four things which you must do the first is that you make your relations with god the exalted such that were a servant of yours to behave thus with you, you would be content with him and not weary of liking him, nor get angry. Whatever, you, wh whatever would dissatisfy you for yourself on the part of this hypothetical servant of yours would dissatisfy you also for God the Exalted. And he is actually your Lord. So we'll take one at a time. Yeah? So the first thing which Imam al-Ghazali says, the first thing you must do before anything and everything else is to come clean with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Come clean with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Set right your relationships, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? And how do you set right? This is a relationship of slavehood, of servitude. Yeah, they say Abd can mean a slave and Abd can also mean a servant. So both, yeah, um, it's not just it's not just we belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he he has complete authority over us. We are also there to do his bidding as he as he desires of us, as he requires of us, as he commands us that we do his bidding, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That worship is not just formal worship, yeah. Worship is not just formal worship. Obedience, obedience is, um, if anything, equally important. Or obedience is overarching and worship falls under the rubric of obedience. Yeah, so, um, so uh, as for the four things which you must do, the first is that you make your relations with God the exalted, such that when a servant of yours were to behave thus with you, you would be content with him. Firstly, that you you please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not wary of liking him, and that you do not give him reason, um, or you do not do anything that displeases him. Yeah? Uh, nor get angry. Yeah? Nor deserving of his wrath. Yeah, so i.e. obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever would dis dissatisfy you for yourself 
on the part of this hypothetical servant of yours should dissatisfy you also for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is actually your Lord. So this servant of yours which you may have, Allahu alam, this servant might be better yawm al qiyamah than the master. So this servant, the master who the master has authority over, it might be that the servant is actually better than the master, whereas this is impossible with regards to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is actually our Lord fi dunya wal akhirah and he's the one who created us. So the first and foremost is to come clean with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the principal, one of the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi is the sin is that which, which gnaws at your heart which causes uneasiness in your heart because you know that this so there's something not right and you have to set that right you have to set it right because that uneasiness is a sign of faith and if that goes away that means faith is diminishing that one acts upon that to the point that that is now addressed that issue is now put to bed. Whatever it is that require, was required upon the slave to do to rectify the situation, the slave does. Such that he is now again pleasing to his master. This is the first, yeah? Before anything and everything that we set ourselves straight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because no, nothing else matters if this is not the that we set ourselves straight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the first thing which Imam al-Ghazali counsels his student with. Bismillah. The second is whenever you interact with people, deal with them as you would wish yourself to be dealt with by them. For a worshipper's faith is incomplete until he wants for other people what he wants for himself. So. Um, the second, so after setting ourselves right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we set ourselves right with the other slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, i.e. fellow human beings, yeah? That we deal with them in the best of manners, yeah? That we do not, um, um, one, of the, one of the greatest deeds, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa one of the best things that a person can do is to bring happiness to the heart of a fellow Muslim, that you make someone else happy. And the Prophet وسلم, would be at the service of, of his um, companions. And say, if, even if like an old woman were to stop me in the middle of the street and ask me for something, I would listen to her. And it is said that the only time the Prophet Sallallahu said no, la, was in the shahada, in the shahada where he negated gods beside Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Said la ilaha illallah. He would never say no to anyone. He would never say no to anyone. Yeah. So we interact with people as we would want to be dealt with as we would want to be dealt with. Yeah, this is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. La yu'minu ahadukum hatta yaku hatta yuhibbu li akhihi yuhibbu ma yuhibbu li nafsihi. That none of you believe that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tied this affair to an affair of belief, of faith, that this is to do with your faith, that you do not believe until you love for your brother that which you love for yourself. Yeah, it is from the essence of belief that you desire good for others as you desire good for yourself. That's it. And the others say, and, um, and those who have commented on this hadith say, they say not just here, Akhi means not just um, Muslim, it also means non Muslims. Or that which you desire for, that you desire for them, that which you desire for yourself, that you desire for them faith that you desire for them success in the hereafter because that's the only real success 
you do not desire for them. OK, I'll be good to them. Oh, I'll just make, I'll will be good friends and it's, uh, and that's that. No, you desire for them faith. And you deal with them on that basis that you deal with them. You do not fall short in your honoring them in your um, being good to them um, in showing them kindness, generosity, concern, care and being there for them when they, they need you so that they see that this is what Islam is about. And this is what we have been commanded with. This is what we have been commanded with. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and and whatever it is, whatever field it is that your work, you, your occupation is or um, profession is that you see. Uh, and if you see and if you know that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destined for you and um, your heart is at peace with what you're doing, then know that this is the, that this profession or field of work which you have is a means to call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that you should use that as such that you you be good, you be good to others as much as you can. Um, and that this is an affair of faith. This is not just an affair of courtesy, courtesies of formalities. This is an affair of faith. The Prophet Sallallahu tied it to one's faith. So that first we set ourselves straight with God, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and that we set ourselves straight with people and that people only have good from us. Yeah, Bismillah. The third is if you read or study knowledge, your knowledge must improve your heart and purge your ego. Just as if you learned that your life would only last another week, inevitably you would not spend it in learning about law, ethics, jurisprudence, scholastic theology and such like, because you would know that these sciences would be inadequate for you. Instead, you would occupy yourself with inspecting your heart, discerning the features of your personality, giving worldly attachments a wide berth, purging yourself of ugly traits, and you would occupy yourself in adoring God the Exalted, worshipping him and acquiring good qualities. And not a day or night passes for any worshipper without his death, during it being a possibility. Carry on, please. It's the same, the third point. Carry on. O disciple, listen to another statement from me and think about it to find salvation. If you, know, if you were notified that the ruler would be coming to you on a visit in a week's time, I know that during this period you would be occupied with nothing but putting in order what you knew his glance would fall on, of your clothing, your person, house, furnishings, and so on. Now think what it is I am hinting at, for you are, intel for you are intelligent. A single word is enough for someone clever. The Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, God will not look upon your forms, nor upon your deeds, but he will look into your hearts and your intentions. If you want the science of the states of the heart, look at the revival and other works of mine. The science is an individual obligation, while others are a collective obligation, except the amount needed for obligations to God the Exalted to be performed. And he it is who will grant you success in acquiring it. So the third thing Imam Al Ghazali says is about seeking knowledge. It's about seeking knowledge, that which you must do. Yeah. But this is again um, central to the life of a Muslim. Like ignorance is unbecoming of a Muslim. The time before Islam. It's not called Ayyamul Kufr. It's not called the days of disbelief. It's, it's not, yeah, because there is no Islam for to be disbelieved. What, what's it called? It's called Ayyam al Jahiliyyah, the days of ignorance. Yeah, 
Jahiliya and Islam do not go together. Do not go together. Yeah. Like darkness and light do not go together. Opposites don't don't meet. Yeah. So ignorance is unbecoming of a Muslim. Is unbecoming of a Muslim. It's something which really debases a Muslim. The fact that they are falling short in their knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they are falling short in their, no, in their knowledge of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That they are falling short in anything which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. An obligation for them to know. It's unbecoming of a Muslim. Of a Muslim. Yeah, but Imam al-Ghazali again, he makes a point of what what exactly he means by seeking knowledge and it's been trans. You the tra it's translated if you read or study knowledge, it's, Imam al-Ghazali doesn't say if he says either either is like when i.e. you must you must study and when you do. Yeah, if is more like uh, you may or may not do it, it seems like um, optional. No, that's not what Imam Ghazali is saying. He says, "Ida qara'at al-ilm." That when you learn, it's a more is proper translation. I, you must learn, and when you do, that this knowledge must improve your heart and purge your ego. Yeah, that this um, Imam Malik say. Imam Malik, what did what did Imam Malik say? "Leis al-ilm bi kathrat al-riwayat." Knowledge is not by multiple transmissions. And Imam, Al -Ma Imam Malik, he was he had multiple transmission. He was one of the greatest muhaddith of his time and possibly the first amongst the uh, muhaddithun. Um, and he says it's not about that. That's uh, it's not about that. But uh, knowledge is nurun yaqzifullahu fi qalb uh, fi qalb al mu'min. Knowledge is the light which Allah subhanahu wa taala thrusts in the heart of the believer. That which illuminates your heart is knowledge. Yeah, i.e. knowledge must go to your heart, shouldn't go to your head. If it goes to your head, it's not knowledge. It's not knowledge. It's just like uh, you're like the person's just messed up big time. Yeah, and how many a person unfortunately falls to this trap again, a trap of the shaitan that knowledge goes to one's head as opposed to going to one's heart and purge your ego and purge your ego. Yeah, such that you do not consider yourself. Um, you do not give yourself um, the time of day in in a manner of speaking. I.e., do not consider yourself great in any regard. Yeah, because everything is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and He gives to whoever He is, wishes as much as He wishes, and He takes away. He snatches from whoever He wishes whenever He wishes. Yeah. Um, and just uh, just as if you have learned that your life would last only another week, inevitably you would not spend it in learning about law. So about academic sciences, ethics, jurisprudence, scholastic theology and such like. I, now, and obviously now he's speaking to his student who has already studied beyond what he needs. Academically, he's he's one of that one student. So he's like, if you had one only one more week to live, you're not going to spend your time even um, Acquiring more of those academic um, of um, um, even um, acquiring more of academic knowledge because you know that what you need with regards to those sciences you already have and it would be inadequate inadequate for you um, to to expend more time in the, in that regard. Instead, you would occupy yourself with inspecting your heart because that is a never-ending journey. Discerning the features of your personality. Yeah, looking into yourself, giving the worldly attachments a wide berth, giving worldly attachments a wide berth. Yeah, yeah. Purging yourself of ugly traits and uh, and you occupy yourself in adoring God the exalted, worshipping him and acquiring good qualities, i.e. that you spend your time purifying your heart. Purifying your heart and purifying your heart obviously means that you purify it from any worldly attachments and all you're concerned with is divine attachment. Yeah. And. And he says, if this is the state of one who has a week to live. 
how should your state be now, given that you know that death can come to you any moment? That you know that the, if you know, and we do know that death can come to us any moment, can come to us any moment, then everything that we have mentioned is even more supplicable to us. Given that that person at least knew he had a week and he knew what he, he, he should be doing in that week, what about us when we don't know when our end will be? And it could be at any moment. Yeah. O oh, disciple, listen to another statement from me and think about it to find salvation. Yeah. So that is to do with knowledge that any knowledge that you seek. So obviously speaking to his student, he's sufficed himself with regards to academic knowledge, that which he needs to know. So Abiy al Ghazali will touch on this in the next paragraph. We'll come back to that bit where he'll, Imam al Ghazali mentioned something in the um, in between. If you're notified that the ruler will be coming to you on a um, on a visit in a week's time, I know that during this period you will be occupied with nothing but putting in order what you knew his glance would fall on uh, of your clothing, your person, house furnishings and so on. Yeah. That's under, that's understandable, yeah. Um, yeah, a person wouldn't in a uh, wouldn't have quote unquote a royalty visiting him and uh, have his clothes lying around on the floor or something like that. He would set his house in order, yeah. N now think what it is uh, I'm hinting at for your intelligent. A single word is enough for someone clever, yeah. And this is again, it's it's important to bear in mind. Yeah, we don't need um, what what we need is to take uh, to learn the lesson to take heed. We don't need the same thing said over and over again in different times, even for the person who takes heed or the person who takes heed. But the state of the human being in general is that the human being, like we said, in San, is related to nisyan, which is forgetfulness, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ ذِكْرَةً تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ That remind people because the constant reminding benefits people. Remind until people get the point, and the people of intellect, they just need one, that's what they get the point, yeah? And what is that, and what, and, and what, what does he say? He brings the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yeah? What is the hadith? In Allah, la yanduru ila suwarikum, wala ila amalikum, wala kin yanduru ila kulubikum, waniyatikum. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look upon your forms. Yeah? Does not matter how you look. Yeah? Um, yeah. But and the, nor upon your deeds. Nor upon your deeds. Yeah, but he will look into your hearts and your intentions. I.e., he'll look at without the soundness of your heart and the soundness of your intention, your deed doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. There is not a deed which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires us to do, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us people who do it wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to pray and he says, Wailulil Musalli. Go unto those who pray. Alladina hum fi salatihim ra'a. Sahun. Those who are forgetful in their prayer and they make a show of it. Alladina hum yura'un. And the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to fast. And he talks about people. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many a person who fasts and he gets nothing from his fasting except hunger and thirst. I.e. They, 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 that's all they did. That's all they did. They only get hunger and thirst. They did not fulfill the requirement of the fast in in um, in reality in, that you fast not just with your stomach, that you fast with your eyes, with your hands, with your entire body, with, most importantly with your heart, with your heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not command us to charity except that Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us of the people who give charity just for the sake so that people might know that all people might say that they are generous and from the first of the people to drag to be dragged into hellfire into the hellfire allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not command us to seek knowledge except that he shows us how 
that can go wrong as well. And many a times it does go wrong. Um, that of the first of the people to be dragged to the hellfire is the alim. So it's the scholar who wanted to be known as a scholar. Of the first people, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to beautify recitation of the Quran. And of the first people to be dragged to the hellfire is the person who wanted to be known as the Qari. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not command us to jihad, except that he warns us of the first people to be dragged to the hellfire is the person who was brave in battle just so that he was in is known that that it would be known that he was brave so there's not a deed there's not a single deed that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us except that he he has shown us he has told us clearly that what matters is in your heart and in your intention and everything else is dependent on that yeah uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That on this day, nothing will benefit a person. His, his, his wealth, not his progeny, nothing will benefit him. Illa man salim. Except for the one who comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart. It's a sound heart. That's, that's the only thing which you need to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart. Yeah. If you want the signs of the states of the heart, look at the revival and other works of mine, Imam Al Ghazali, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And inshaAllah Ta'ala, we pray that we get to do that, inshaAllah Ta'ala. We make an intention that we are able to study the Ihya, inshaAllah Ta'ala, in some way, inshaAllah Ta'ala, uh, such that we can benefit. We can benefit from Imam Al Ghazali, like we have been benefiting all this time. Literally, we have been sitting at his feet and learning from him. We have been sitting at the feet of one of the greatest people the Summa has ever produced. The science of um, purification is an individual obligation, whilst others are collective obligation. He says this science in its entirety, what by me saying this science, this science in and of itself is an individual obligation. Spirituality in its entirety is an individual obligation. Yeah, to purify one's heart is an individual obligation. Whereas all the other sciences, they're collective obligations, i.e. the science in and of itself, the hukum upon the science is fard kifaya. Whereas spirituality, no. Everyone has the obligation to purify themselves. Yeah, Except, and while the others are a collective obligation, except to the amount needed for obligations to God, the exalted to be performed. So only that which you need of a particular science becomes obligatory, a personal obligation upon you, an individual obligation becomes far the ayn. As for purifying your uh, purifying our souls, that is uh, an individual obligation, all of it. <clears throat> And he it is who will grant you success in acquiring it. And وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٌ وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ That my success is not is uh, is not due to anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach you. Allahu bi kulli shayin alim and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who knows everything. Yeah. Bismillah. Any thoughts or comments? No, this, no, this intention is, is big. Um, you know, very often in the world we get distracted and um, um, we, we downplay intention, whereas we should be actually Intention, I mean, it may be wrong here, but intention is more important than the action itself. The, um, the action is predicated upon the intention. OK, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah. Um, very often, um, you know, with the pace of this world, um, mm. do something and when you look back, you're thinking I could have gained more. If I'd, if I'd 
done the right intention or added the right intention to this action. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, um, like if you, if you, you know, the, the intention is is vast. You can keep on, um, you know, like if you if you do a good act, it could be to please Allah. It could be to help you in the hereafter. Um, mm. But very often, all we do is, you know, just like the bare minimum with regards to intention, move on to the next thing. Whereas, if if I think there was less, we we were, we allowed ourselves to be less distracted in the world, um, mm. the opportunities would be more fruitful. I think in the next world. No doubt, no doubt. Um, 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 in in ajula. That the human being has been created in haste. The mm. human being is inclined towards haste. Um, that the human being lacks patience. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to patience. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then say? Inna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those who are patient. Or patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say in the Quran, in Allah is with those who pray, pray. Allah says he is with those who are patient. And Allah also says, in Allah yuhibbu sabirin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are patient. Yeah. So we do um and um yeah, we sh yeah. Haste stops people stops the human being from thinking from reflecting obviously what mm -hmm. he says ties into that that you don't uh, you don't have time to ponder to, to reflect on what you're doing to really think about what you're doing um and many a times and because of the pace of the lives people don't think about their lives at all in um on, in a in a broader sense we just do things because everyone else is doing them we just live life like we're just like a flock of sheep if we just go through the motions, we just do the same thing over and over again, and we do things in life which everyone, quote unquote, expects each other to do, and um, just go, go through lives. And before we realize it, it's like, subhanAllah, where did all the time go? True. Yeah. True. Yeah. So, no doubt. Yeah. And, um, um, and um, and uh, Imam Al Ghazali obviously is is a Shafi as well, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala bless the Shafi is um, uh, very particular with intentions, very particular with intentions. Um, so yeah, and and no doubt in a general sense, um, intentions is what makes that which is permissible to that which is. Um, um, pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you could in so while you're playing or you're spending time with your family that you intend through it worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now it is something which be becomes um, um, worthy of a reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the fact that you remembered that you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and even if you were doing the same thing, you know, whatever it is that you're playing or you're doing, you took them out or did whatever it is. You're doing the same thing, but the fact that you remember this is Lilla, this is Lilla, that you constantly remind yourself this is Lilla, this is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it becomes something lofty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now it's worship, you're engaging in worship because like we said, obedience is worship. In fact, what? Worship is a subset of obedience. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting how the book is also tying everything together because um, um, I think it was the first or the second lesson um, you mentioned. Um, uh, you mentioned that intention again. We talked about intention and you said when you go to work, make the intention that you're going to work to provide for your family. Um, mm. And uh, and and just the uh, action of because you because I remember uh, when you said this I was thinking I need to go to work anyway so I might as well get a bit more reward from it <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah um yeah but 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 better than that don't don't think of it I need to go to work anyway think of it like if I didn't have to provide for my family I wouldn't be doing this oh it's another level yes yes like why would I be doing this it's just because 
I, I need to do like what, 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 why do you need to do it if not for your family it's like I'm doing this only because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, I'm responsible in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take care of my family and I want to treat them well and I want to honor them and give them what they need to provide for them mm-hmm. otherwise I have nothing to do with this yeah, yeah. I, have, I have no need of it yeah so that is better yeah and also to add to that when I'm there I'm there calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost through my actions first and foremost through my actions that they recognize that this is not normal in what is normal in an abnormal world (laughs) yes that they see in you the light of God that they see in you the light of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they recognize that this is not normal yeah. <clears throat> True. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Right. The fourth is that you should not stock up more than the world's. You should not stock up more of the world's produce than is adequate for one year, as the messenger of of God, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, used to arrange this for one of his wives, saying, "O oh God, make the sustenance of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's family enough." And he used not to arrange this for all his wives, but he used to arrange it for the one in whose heart he knew was a weakness. As for whoever of his wives was confident, he used to not arrange more than one or half a day's sustenance for her. Yeah, so this, the fourth. So the first one is to set yourself straight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second one, set yourself straight with everyone else, everyone, all um, fellow human beings. Third one, seek knowledge in manner, in the manner that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, such that it elevates, it elevates you, yeah, by purifying your heart, yeah. And the fourth is that, yeah, do not hold yeah, do not hold of anything of this world. So basically, do not cling to things of this world. Do not cling to things of this world. Yeah. Um, and um, the most that you strive for is to have a wor- year's worth of sustenance. A year's worth of sustenance. And um, pe- and people saving up, saving up, saving up, saving up for what? You're saving up for the dunya, but what about saving up for the akhirah? Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give us wealth to hoard it. Did not give us wealth to hoard it. And before the obligatory zakat, 140th, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had to give up everything that they had in excess. Everything. After, the, uh, after their needs had been fulfilled, they had to give up everything in charity. Yeah, so we should, um, and and this is something, no doubt, is is uh, is clearly an issue um, um, in the way in which we live our lives, in the societies in which we live our life, and this is the this is the same world over everywhere now. This is how it is um, that um, we are concerned. Ten years from from now, how we will be with regards to our life in the world. Whereas we are not concerned about the eternity we have in the Akhirah. I'm not just saying 10 years in the Akhirah. It's like tens of millions of millions. It's eternity. You can't quantify it. Yeah, that we are concerned. Okay, in five years, I want this. 10 years, I want that. 15 years. Yeah. What about the Akhirah? What about the Akhirah? And who says you'll, you'll see those years which you're planning for? Yeah. Oh, one of my my colleagues who I was speaking to um, when I was at work, and he was like, he was saying about like, he was coming close to retirement. He's like, um, it's weird. Um, it's a weird. He's, he's saying it's like a weird feeling, you know, like coming close to retirement, and you've been putting away all this money towards your pension, and you and you know so many people who have just passed away, literally, as soon as they retired. 
like they're just retired and within a year or two or a few years they just passed away and all the life uh, and they're saying up all their lives for what yeah and um not not to say that um uh, there's inherently anything wrong with pensions per se that's that's not the discussion or that's not the point but the point is to ponder over the fact that one is putting away provision for their life in the dunya um, with much more concern than putting away provision for ourselves for themselves in the akhirah which again from for a muslim doesn't make any sense at all doesn't make any sense at all yeah but our first and foremost concern is what are we say what are we uh, putting away for ourselves for the akhirah that what we are storing for ourselves for the akhirah yeah once um a, a lamp was gifted um um to the house of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to aisha radiallahu anha our mother and um and then um and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was away he was outside um uh, and um and um, and a person after person came a poor person asking for something from the house of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam aisha radiallahu anha she gave away part of portions of the lamp which was given to them as a gift she gave away portions until she kept just kept one uh, thigh one thigh that there are is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would um he was something the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam preferred um and when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came back uh, our mother aisha radiallahu anha she said to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um we had the whole lamp but everything is gone now except for this thigh the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said la ya aisha no aisha everything else we have except for this because this we are going to consume in the dunya that is there for us in the akhirah yeah that we are more concerned with what we save for ourselves for the akhirah than what we save for ourselves in the dunya and many a times it's actually that you 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 take from our akhirah to use in the dunya in reality if one were to think about it deeply they're actually taking from our akhirah to use to have it in the dunya whereas we should the people of intellect that take they take from their dunya and they, they to give it for their akhirah umar anhu, like in his time the islamic um uh, khilafat it spread rapidly and uh, many lands fell to the muslims and a lot of riches started flowing into medina a lot of wealth started coming in and and umar radiallahu he breaks down he's like crying and people his companions they ask him why are you crying this is good for us this is good uh, this is what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam promised us that we, we that we would have these victories and uh, umar radiallahu said <clears throat> My two companions, i.e., the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Abu Bakr radhiyallahu anhu, they are they were better than me, and they did not have this what which Allah subhanahu wa taala has put in my hands, and I am afraid that Allah subhanahu wa taala has given whatever it is what He was going to give me in the dunya, as opposed and and uh, I have nothing in the akhirah. And I have nothing in the akhirah. Whereas pe people who are blessed or quote unquote, who are given, it can be a blessing or not, depending upon how the person chooses to use. People given wealth or any kind of luxury in this world, one of the tricks of the shaitan is that, oh, Allah SWT has given us so much in this world, so he'll also give us so much in the next world. Read Surah Kahaf. The, two, the the people who, who had the two guarders. The one he says, oh, if I if I if I die and go and meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm sure he'll give me better than that which I have already. That they think, quote unquote, favors in this life indicates favors in the next life as well. From the tricks of the shaitan, from the tricks of the shaitan. Yeah. That 
we should we should seek to make our focus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Akhirah, the Akhirah. Well, Akhirah to Khairun wa Abqa, that the next world, the next life is better and more lasting. Better and more lasting. Yeah. Bismillah. O oh, disciple, oh, disciple, I have addressed the things you asked for in this discourse, and you must carry them out. And do not forget me in this, to mention me in your devout supplications. As for the prayer which you requested from me, look for it amongst the supplications in collections of authentic traditions and recite this prayer during all the moments you have, in particular as a supererogative supererogation um, after your formal prostrations. Okay, oh so God. Imam, so Imam al-Ghazali is now he's going to do the dua to finish his letter, quote unquote. So that's the end of the book, inshallah ta'ala. Well, alhamdulillah, and praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, um, but before we finish, um, the point is that again, like Imam Al Ghazali says, this is not quote unquote the end. This is quote unquote the beginning. That um, if we were to truly reflect, if we were to reflect on everything which Imam Al Ghazali has mentioned in a letter, this would suffice us in reality. Yom Al Qiyamah. That we, if we were to live up to that which Imam Al Ghazali um, calls us to in this letter. It would be, it would suffice as Yom Al Qiyamah. It would suffice as Yom Al Qiyamah. Um, and that is the point, the, that is the point that we take heed, that we take heed, that that we that we uh, reflect upon that which we take and we try to live our lives accordingly. Otherwise, like Imam Al Ghazali says, that which you learn is a proof against you as opposed to being a proof for you, Yom Al Qiyamah. So any any final thoughts or comments before we finish, inshallah ta'ala with the dua. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah khair inshallah ta'ala. Jama, would you like to say anything? Um, I just feel like this has been a bit of a an antidote to to everything, <laughs> to life, to this distraction, to the craziness of the world that calls you to what appears to be true, and in reality, it's all madness. It's there's no, you know, this is truth. This is the truth, and yeah. It helps you to see truth for truth and falsehood for falsehood. And this, I, I guess, all that I've taken is just yeah. like, it's not even a drop in the ocean, right? It's, it's just the beginning, like you said. And subhanAllah, I just, uh, you know, it's I'm very grateful to be here. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, and, and what you say is, is a profound in the sense. First, it might be a drop in the ocean, but it might be that that drop suffices us. That drop suffices us. Yeah, that drop purifies us. Yeah, we don't need the entire ocean to purify ourselves. Yeah, we need we need just a, yeah, just need a little bit. Yeah, well, and many a times a person might take and take and take from the ocean and doesn't get purified, and a person just takes a glass and it's purified. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, um, w w it's important to contextualize that which we take, um, to. To, um, to uh, the lives that which we live, and um, and that which you say, like with regards to it being an antidote to um, that which we live, um, the um, the negative effects that we have um, um, from that which we ha encounter in our lives in the daily basis. Hopefully, it's not just going to be an antidote. It should get to the point where, quote unquote, you're vaccinated. Yeah, you don't. It, it doesn't affect you anymore. You don't need an antidote now. 
yeah that it's that you you that we are now inshallah ta'ala conduits for good rather than seeking security and safety for ourselves obviously which is the first thing we should be doing um that it's we no longer are quote unquote trying to protect ourselves but rather we are trying to now spread goodness to others it's not that we are trying to negate harm from ourselves that we now are in a position inshallah ta'ala to to spread goodness to others and that is the reason that we mentioned that we are there to give we are not here to take and if there's anything uh, if, uh, obviously we try to protect ourselves from harm but we try to reach to a point where we are there to now share good uh, goodness with others inshallah ta'ala yeah so quote unquote be vaccinated <laughs> not just an antidote yeah uh uh inshallah ta'ala and um, no doubt it's been uh, um it's been a blessing for me as well um to go through the book um and um imam al azali no doubt is one of those few people who who transcends time um that his um, um that his works they speak to people regardless of their time and place because he speaks about realities which do not change yeah there are things which change with time and place and there are things which don't change with time and place and many times those things those realities which don't change with time and place they are the most important things which people need to be mindful of yeah be mindful of <clears throat> so bismillah we start with the dua of imam al-ghazali inshallah ta'ala <clears throat> اللهم إني أسألك من النعمة تمامها ومن العصمة دوامها ومن الرحمة شمولها ومن العافية حصولها ومن العيش أرغده ومن العمر أسعده ومن الإحسان أتمه ومن الإنعام أعمه ومن الفضل أعذبه ومن اللطف أقربه اللهم كن لنا ولا تكن علينا اللهم اختم بالسعادة آجالنا وحقق بالزيادة آمالنا وأقرن بالعافية عدونا وآصالنا واجعل إلى رحمتك مصيرنا ومالنا واسبب سجال عفوك على ذنوبنا ومن علينا بإصلاح عيوبنا وجعل التقوى زادنا وفي دينك اجتهادنا وعليك توكلنا واعتمادنا اللهم ثبتنا على نهج الاستقامة وعذنا في الدنيا من موجبات الندامة يوم القيامة وخفف عنا ثقل الأوزار وأرزقنا عيشة الأبرار وأكف وكفنا واصرف عنا شر الأشرار واعتق رقابنا ورقاب آبائنا وأمهاتنا وإخواننا وأخواتنا من النار برحمتك يا عزيز يا غفار يا كريم يا ستار يا عليم يا جبار يا الله يا الله يا الله برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ويا أول الأولين ويا آخر الآخرين ويا ذا القوة المتين ويا راحم المساكين ويا أرحم الراحمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين O oh God, I beg thee in regard to grace for its completeness, in regard to protection for its permanence, in regard to mercy for its totality, in regard to well-being for its realization, in regard to livelihood for the most plentiful, in regard to life for the most happy, in regard to beneficence for the most perfect, in regard to favor for the most inclusive, in regard to generosity for the most sweet, and in regard to gentleness for the most intimate. O oh God, 
be for us and do not be against us. O God, conclude our lives with happiness and make our hopes abundantly real. Unite our mornings and evenings in well-being and entrust our destiny and future state to thy mercy. Pour the vessel of thy forgiveness over our sins. Grant us the correction of our faults. Make God conscious our provision and make our exertion to be for thy religion and our trust and our confidence to be in thee. O God, set us upon the path of righteousness. Protect us in the world from causes of regret on the day of resurrection. Lighten the weight of our sins and do us with the way of the life of the godly. Restrain us from and avert us from the evil of the wicked and release our necks and the necks of our fathers, mothers, brothers and sisters from hellfire. By thy mercy, thou infinitely precious, thou ever forgiving, thou bountiful one, thou wailer of sins, thou omniscient and omnipotent. O God, O God, O God, by thy mercy, thou most merciful of the merciful, thou first of all and last of all, thou mighty Lord of power, thou who hast mercy on the needy, thou most merciful of the merciful, there is no God but thou, glory be to thee, I am a sinner, God bless our lineage, Lord Muhammad. God bless our liege, Lord Muhammad, all his family and companions, and praise belongs to God, the Lord of the worlds. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. الحمد لله. So we've completed the book, inshallah ta'ala. And like we mentioned, inshallah ta'ala, we'll be starting hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, the book of uh, Habib Umar, inshallah ta'ala, um, on Sufism, inshallah ta'ala, and uh, we look to benefit from it, inshallah ta'ala, um, in a couple of weeks' time. In a couple of weeks' time. Um, in the meanwhile, I was wondering, um, am I okay to make these recordings public? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Gemma, is that okay? Uh, I, can, I, can, I can hear her moving towards her computer. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, Sorry, I was just with the baby. Uh, that's fine. Inshallah. Uh, okay. Khair, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah. Um, so, inshallah ta'ala, with that we finish. And um, well, when we publicize the course, inshallah ta'ala, we'll let you know, inshallah ta'ala, the next one. And in the meanwhile, the Tajweed course starts on Sunday, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah. Anyone who's interested, inshallah ta'ala, um, yeah, encourage them to join, inshallah ta'ala, um, yeah, inshallah ta'ala with that. Yeah, Muhammad, you have something to say? Jazakallah khair, no, it's, it's, um, um, I first bought this book in 2005. I remember the date because I bought two, I wanted to give one uh, to one of the nurses at work as a gift because he was very helpful in my, in my first job. And okay. subhanAllah, um, it's the first time I've read it cover to cover all in one go and actually understood uh, or, or tried to, you know, um, instead of just reading for the sake of reading, subhanAllah, it's, um, it's yeah, been very so, beneficial. Uh, yeah, it's the same here as well. Yeah, it's uh, reading by oneself is, is good, no doubt, but um, it ha it helps when uh, um, because there's blessing, like, like there's blessing in um, in gatherings, gatherings of good. Halakat, halakat al dhikr, remembering Allah subhanahu wa taala in gathering, is um, is uh, no doubt great with Allah subhanahu wa taala. The one who remembers Allah subhanahu wa taala privately, the Prophet said, Allah subhanahu wa taala remembers uh, that person by himself. And the one who remembers, uh, those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a gathering, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remembers them in a ga gathering which is better than their gathering. Yeah, and such gatherings, the angels descend upon such gatherings, um, uh, enveloping them in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no doubt, um, 
this is this blessing is because of the fact that we can come together to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in an attempt to purify ourselves inshallah ta'ala so this is no doubt no doubt a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alhamdulillah and inshallah ta'ala inshallah we'll finish the اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وفقهنا إذا جهلنا وارزقنا علما نافعا وعملا متقبلا خالصا لوجهك الكريم وافتح علينا فتوح العارفين وألحقنا بعبادك الصالحين وجعلنا من خدمة هذا الدين وجز الله عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما هو أهله وجزاكم الله كل خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Wa alaikum wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.